Well, there it is. They reel you back in. 22 point <laughs> win for Syracuse. We'll get into everything that went on in this game, including some developments out of the SU bench. Didn't know if we'd see that. We did. Beheim using some of his reserves. We'll talk about that. And 23,000 people, Tim, told me to go F myself. We will also <laughs> dive into that on today's show on the Locked On Syracuse podcast. <laughs> Locked on Syracuse, your daily podcast on the Syracuse Orange, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. What's up and welcome in. This is the Locked On Syracuse podcast. I'm Tyler Rocky, joined by Tim Leonard. Follow us on Twitter at LO underscore Syracuse. And also thank you for making us your first listen every single day. The only place to get daily orange podcast we're free and available on all platforms that includes youtube so check us out subscribe to the channel there also find us on wherever you get your podcast whatever platform you decide to use whether it's spotify apple rate review subscribe all that fun stuff so syracuse picks up one of its most dominant wins of the year this was the offense that we always talked about that you could get on any sort of given night this is the 94 point offense that we've been Kind of preaching this team can go out and have these sort of wins they can also have the losses like we saw against Pitt when nothing in the world is falling but there's a couple of takeaways i think that we can get from this game and we'll get into later on some of the stuff with um what's next so where do we go from here with the orange but let's start with the bench because i think that was one of the big storylines obviously buddy Beheim, fantastic in this game 30 points i mean you can't say enough. This is a, a great spot for him. I think we all kind of could see it coming. And I even joked about it like, hey, this might be a nice little audition for the, the Bucks <laughs> next year with, with Giannis yeah. and, and the Nazis in the stands. But that was cool to see. But let's get into the bench because there are a couple of big contributions that we saw there. Benny Williams gets 10 minutes in this game. Frank Anselm gets 17 minutes in this game. A lot of the, the hubbub in the first half was about Benny, but really it should have been angled on Frank because he was phenomenal when Jesse Edwards got in early foul trouble, and I think it really built some confidence. We always talk with Jesse. His problem isn't first-half foul trouble. His problem is second-half foul trouble. But he got into a little bit of danger in that first half, and I think it let Frank Anselm step in. He has 7.6 rebounds and really put together a nice performance on both ends of the floor. Yeah, funny that Frank did it against the team that Jim Beheim used Jimmy Beheim at the five yeah. against earlier in the year. And what Jesse got been? a lot of foul trouble, which was highly scrutinized at the time. And, you know, whatever, we're past that now. But Frank did play really solid in this game. And I think he's been a little bit up and down here as we've got into ACC play. Been a little bit tough to evaluate him because he's not out there for very long. But he gets some extended minutes here. And Benny, too, that was the nice thing is, Benny made it through like a substitution out there. There was one yeah. point while he was out there where someone got pulled and he had to be looking over at the bench like, wow, that wasn't me for a change. <laughs> yeah, I can he still went play. eight and a half straight minutes in yeah. that second half from when he checked in. He got eight and a half minutes till I think I want to say it was like the three minute mark, three and a half minute mark. And then he actually came back in towards the end of the first half, which I was a little surprised about. Uh, he got like a minute and a half breather and played the final minute there. But Benny went for an extended run, thought he looked solid on defense, starting to get a little more aggressive. But the next step for him is developing that that inside game so he can be more of a threat to score. He has that confidence where you can throw him out there next year and who knows, maybe he can get you 14 points a game if he gets aggressive and gets a little confidence and just get those mistakes out now, right? Like yep. the misses at the rim. There's no harm in missing shots this season at this point because I think you and I both see the writing on the wall that this team's not going to the NCAA tournament. Hell, they might not even go to the NIT tournament with the way that their record is right now. So let those mistakes happen now. That's the important part. Yeah, and I liked how Jim Beheim said he he probably planned to play him in the second half, but that unit was just playing so good in the yeah. second half, that starting group. And I guess they did technically dip into the bench once the walk-ons came in and hit some fun baskets at the end of the game, which was how about cool. that? Was it seven walk-on points at the end? Did I see? Yeah, they they padded the bench points. I know uh Arthur Cords had the three and Patty had the layup. So it was yep. five, five total uh walk-on points at the end. Yeah, which it felt like the team just needed sort of that, like we the way that there was win. a big celebration at the yeah. end too. It, it was good to see. I mean, it's been such a tough year 
everyone's trying hard by all accounts. It's not really an effort thing, at least in my opinion. And they come back home and they needed a bounce back spot. I thought it was going to be an opportunity for them to win. Interesting though, that when we did the wake preview podcast, we were going off the Ken Palm number, but even the betonline.ag number opened as wake three point favorites. And we were both kind of thinking maybe this is a bounce back spot. And then all of a sudden you look up on Saturday and even in the morning before the 8 PM tip, it had already flipped to Syracuse ended up being, I think yeah. a one and a half point favorite at tip yeah. time. Mm-hmm. Yeah, Which, and Anthony DeBundo was all over that too. Yeah, he, he loves shout Syracuse. out to DeBundo. He's he's killing he's it on with the, the spots. He's going the, the Syracuse spots. beats. Yeah, if mm-hmm. you, if you ever want to make some money off Syracuse, it might require you to bet against Syracuse sometimes. But he's been like eight and one this year. He said when he's been betting Syracuse. So shout out to him. They scored fifty five points in the second half, and they scored fifty three points in the entire game against Pitt. And the offense is in this weird stretch now, where Last two home games, they passed 90 points going back to the Clemson game. Mm -hmm. The two road games, they were in 50 points. So it's just been Jekyll and Hyde a little bit. Yeah, and you'd expect that too, right? Like you got your your finite points that you're aiming for, your spots at home. You feel you're always going to shoot better at home. You always are. And that's what this, I mean, just look at Buddy Beheim. He goes out there, drops 30, hits six threes in this game. Cole Swider had a fantastic game. We'll talk about Cole in a little bit as well, but Getting back to the bench here, and again, I know Samir Torrance played six minutes in this game, coming off an injury. I didn't expect a lot out of him. I, I think he was, and he looked fine out there when he was. He looked healthy enough to be out there. But I'm with you. I I didn't see any reason for Jim Beheim to to go to the bench as much in that second half, aside from getting Frank some minutes just to spell Jesse from a foul struggle standpoint. But um, when that unit was playing well, the first unit was playing well, and, and Again, Jim Beheim's going to coach to win these games, right? Like, there's still something on the line for him, whether it's getting to a thousand wins again, whether it is making sure he doesn't have another or a first ever, I should say, sub 500 season. Like, he's still going to go out and coach to win in these games. He's not just going to strictly coach to develop. And this was a, a good win against a, a solid Wake Forest team and a Wake Forest team that I'm sure this Orange squad feels like they should have swept this season. Yeah, that is tough. And, That's the sad thing is when you get a win like this, you're still looking back thinking, man, I wish we had that Florida State game, that Wake game. That There's been so many games that we've been right there. Miami, you had the big lead on the road and and blew it. But Benny plays 10 minutes in this game. If he had told me at the start of the game he's only going to play 10 minutes, I might have been a little bit disappointed with that considering Bull was not an option because he's out due to COVID protocols. But it was a 10 minutes that I was okay with. It was an important 10 minutes. Yeah, he played an extended amount of time, like we talked about, in that first half, which is good to see. I don't want him getting out there for two, three spot minutes, two, three spot Mm -hmm. minutes. I don't think that really is good for him right now. And Frank Anselm played 17 minutes, which is partially because Jesse was in foul trouble. You know, if Jesse's going to be in foul trouble, if he's going to play 22 minutes and Frank is going to play 17, I'm cool with that. The starters did get a lot of minutes in this game, but I'm fine with that because there's no reason to take Buddy off the floor when he's got 30 points a season high, six for 11 from three. And he just got in one of those modes that he can get in that no one else on this team can, where he can literally take over a game. And really very few players in the country can do it to the degree that he is doing it, where there's times that you just feel like they should put every defender they have on him. And it's weird that they don't double him more, honestly, when you're watching it. Yeah. And and it was across the board with buddy too. I I do have a couple other things I want to hit on with buddy. Um, but getting back to to the whole Benny and, and, and Frank conundrum, like it was good. They, they played meaningful minutes in this game. And I think you, you kind of hit it on the head there. If you told me Benny played 10 minutes in this game, I'd feel a little bit upset. But he played 10 meaningful minutes. Another thing that I think is sort of flying under the radar with him, and it, it's not going to show in the stat sheet in this game because he didn't have any assists, but I think he's a pretty good passer. And that's something that I've sort of picked up on. It's He's doing some things that aren't going to st- that aren't going to show up in the stat sheet right now, but should warrant playing time, and eventually will show up in the stat sheet a little bit more down the road. I think when he has different players around him as well. But I I've really liked some of the passing that he's done so far this season. I've also liked the the situational defense that he plays and, and just being in the right spot at the right time, always having his hands up. He's doing some of these little things right, and God willing, he's still on this team next season. I think he will be a meaningful contributor next year. I I can see him taking a significant leap in his second year. 
he's primed for it for sure. We know the talents there, the athleticism. You're spot on on the passing. I think that's probably his best trait, honestly, is his playmaking, his vision. And sometimes even Jim Beheim has said this, but he could be a little bit more selfish when he gets towards the inside, when he gets in the painted area. And he did do a really good take on one of his first times touching the ball in the first half, just didn't quite finish it. That's kind of the next step because yeah. he just hasn't really been involved in a lot of plays down low. And Jim Beheim touched on this on the coaches show, how he's six, nine two twenty, and he can jump out of the gym. He's super athletic. Like, that's sometimes it's we that's take rare breed granted. stuff. Yeah. Uh-huh. Six, nine, two twenty is rare. You know, <laughs> like that's about as good as you can get at the forward spot in terms of his build, his makeup, his athleticism. So it's there. It's just sort of getting the confidence behind him as well. And that, that will come the more he plays. I feel like, yeah, no, I'm excited. And I think this was a building block in the right direction for both Benny and Frank. And again, a lot of the, conversation has been centered around Benny Williams moving forward for the rest of the season, but Frank Anselm's development certainly is important as well. And having a good solid backup option behind Jesse, again, Frank's going to be one of those question marks in the off season. Will he be back? Won't he be back? Jim Beheim's addressed it a number of times. He's hopeful that he's back, but if Frank Anselm's developing nicely and, and Jesse Edwards keeps playing the way he is, it's tough. It's going to be tough for Frank to see minutes, and I wouldn't blame him for transferring. But the, the hope right now is that you can make all of this uh, a one cohesive unit. I do want to hit on a, a question that we were asked actually in our DMs. I'll get to that, and in, in, it's in regards to Frank. I'll do that in just a little bit. But first, I've got to tell you about an incredible app anyone who buys gas needs to know about. It's called Get Upside. Our listeners are earning cash back for every gallon of gas every time they fill up. Just download the free Get Upside app in the App Store or Google Play right now and use the promo code SCORE for $0.25 cents per gallon or more on your first fill up. That's cash back. Don't pay full price at the pump anymore. Get cash back using Get Upside. Just download the app for free and use the promo code SCORE for $0.25 cents per gallon or more on your first tank. Some people who drive a lot are making as much as two to three hundred dollars a year in cash back and the best part is there is no catch the cash back gets added right to your account and you can cash out anytime to your bank account paypal or an e-gift card for amazon and other brands just download the free get upside app and use the promo code score to get 25 cents per gallon or more cash back on your first tank that's promo code score all right getting back to frank anselm here is there a way for syracuse to use both anselm and Edwards on the floor at the same time? That's a question because there's certainly skill in both of those guys, right? There's certainly athleticism in both of those guys. Is there a way that you can get both Jesse and Frank on the floor at the same time? I want to hear your answer on that. It probably is worth experimenting, and I use that word sort of as a joke, but it's never going to happen. Jim Beheim has been pretty clear about it. I feel like to this point he has been asked about it, and – He doesn't feel that it's the right decision. So I haven't really given too much thought to it because I know that it's probably not going to happen. If I was the coach, I probably would experiment with it occasionally, but I see why he's sort of hesitant to do it because from a spacing standpoint on offense, it would not be great. And I guess Mm -hmm. you say that, well, you're throwing John bull out there. Like it's the, he's at least more of a factor on offense than John bull. So I hear you on that, but, John Bull is moving around. He sends some screens. That's kind of the plus. And Frank can do that too. I think it's something that the fan base really wants to happen, but I I just don't really see it ever happening given how Jim Beheim has addressed it in the past. I'm with you. I agree with you, but I think there's one way that you could make it work. It's not going to happen this year. It would have to be something that's incorporated for next season. But if one of those guys can develop an 18-footer, then I think you could maybe work it. But I'm with you for Such the most part. Such a big ask, though. I it just, is a big I, ask. And yeah. we saw Jesse step out and try one in this past game against Wake Forest, too. Um, but I don't know. Like, that's the next dimension for both of their games, really. Um, I, I, I'll say this. I think a lot of Jesse Edwards' offensive success this season has been the result of he's got those shooters around him. He will rarely see a double team because of the respect that you have to show to the other four guys on the floor from a shooting perspective. And then you're just asking Jesse to win one-on-one matchups, usually against a smaller big man. And I'm not trying to diminish what he's done this year, but he is thriving in his role very well because of what's being asked and and the spacing that he's kind of got down low. 
And by bringing Frank down, you may lend yourself to some more one-on-twos for Jesse. And that's a tough thing to, to kind of ask for a center to not only do that, but he's going to have to become a lot better passing the basketball as well. Is it something worth experimenting with? Yeah, because it certainly makes you better on the defensive side. But I just – you would need to see one of those guys develop some sort of outside game, I think, for it to be worth experimenting with for right now. Yeah, and I don't see that day coming. And that's yeah. not even really a slight to Jesse Edwards. I just don't see a world where he's hitting 18-footers at Syracuse, given that he's entering but his we fourth also, year next in year. In fairness, we also didn't think there was going to be a world where Jesse Edwards would be a guy who scored 20 points, what, multiple times this year? No, I could have seen that world coming. I mean, I think I didn't expect it to come this quickly, maybe, but we were all sort of confident that he was going to make strides and develop. My thinking is he still does have, and I'm not to the degree that Jim Beheim thinks he's like not a factor on offense sometimes the way he talks about him or one of the recent press conferences that he got a lot of flack for. I think he's better than that, but I still sort of see what Beheim's saying. Like there are times where when Jesse gets it on an island, he gets exposed a little bit and I would rather him just go all in this summer on post moves on toughness, yeah. rebounding. Like there's so many areas of his game that he could expand on that. I don't think his next step necessarily is the 18 footer because that right. feels so far off. Right. I, I'd almost rather see Frank try it and be that guy that steps out. Cause I think Frank down low, he certainly has the aggressiveness. I think he's more aggressive offensively than Jesse is. Um, I do think though that Jesse's obviously more polished, better footwork down low. Frank's going to elevate and, and that's what he does really, really well. I'm surprised we don't see more lobs for those two also. And maybe it's the fact that you don't have a guard that can get in and get you in lob situations, but those are two pretty athletic big men, especially in the case of Frank who can jump out of the gym. And I t t uh, tweeted this too, during the game. One of the things that's been a huge revelation for me, at least this year with Frank, he is extremely coordinated. Like he mm -hmm. is catching the basketball. He can high point a basketball, both from an offensive and defensive standpoint. And Jesse too. And with the offensive centers that we've seen the past couple of years, or the offensive games of centers that we've seen the past five or so years, really, coordination has not been a strong suit. Yeah. And I feel like we're almost taking it for granted. And I remember when Frank committed at first, we were reading some of the things from his AAU coach, his high school coach, and they were talking about, yeah, his coordination is really good for a 6'10 guy, and he likes to run the floor. And to us, that was like, I mean, that was like speaking Chinese almost for, for what Syracuse centers have had the last couple of years because it's just night and day from what we're used to at the center position from the offensive side. Yeah, we probably have taken it for granted just how good the centers have been this year. And it's specifically Jesse because Frank mm -hmm. isn't playing a ton. But in this game, when he is asked to play a little bit more, he steps up. I think you're right. There should be more lobs. There probably should be more of finding the roller in the pick and roll. The one thing that I will give Joe Girard a lot of credit for, and I don't, I guess, do this a lot recently, but he did play very nicely in this game. He was Syracuse yep. Joe in this game. Definitely not mm -hmm. Sienna Joe. He Although very our good. guy Zach, our guy Zach was tempting us. He was edging <laughs> us a little bit, saying like, because once we tweeted that, I guess he turned the ball over a couple times and oh, you jinxed him. He, yeah, he. he <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Joe was peeking its head around the corner a little bit, trying to yeah, get in well, on the action. I mean, I think he had two turnovers in the end. Syracuse two. only had yeah. five turnovers in this game, and that's and the reason why they were turnovers this game. too. They were too late turnovers. So. Yeah, right. They didn't really matter as much. Yeah. He, they forced 17 turnovers. They got a lot of steals and deflections. They played like old Syracuse in this game. They actually won the turnover margin by 12, which is huge. And then that allowed them to get out in transition. And what I was just about to say is Joe's passing in transition, that look ahead quarterback style pass. It's I good. will give him credit for that. That is yeah. a unique skill. Buddy hit Cole Swider on one of them as well. That led to that big dunk to make it a 19 point lead in the second half. But Joe is one of the better look ahead QB type yeah. passers in the country. I know there's a joke to be made there that he does have that quarterback vision from playing football maybe. And that may have been part of it, but they got to get out in transition more. Like this is where Syracuse used to thrive and the big East Syracuse teams. And they don't really have that team that can do it this year, but do it as much as you can, because that's what the zone used to do. They used to flip possessions on teams. Yeah. That was something that I remember the Georgetown game specifically where Joe hits, 
Frank Anselm in stride down the floor and it's an electric two-handed slam on the road. Like those are the things that Joe does well. For as much flack as he catches, he shoots the ball really well when he's especially when he's playing off the ball a little bit more and he can do those, those transit he can lead a break like that. And he can and it's get, a fine and, line and, because he does mess it up sometimes, or there's right. times where I'm like, oh, and then they catch it. <laughs> it works yeah. out like it doesn't look good. He does have a lot of trust in his teammates yeah. on those plays, which you need to have. Right. There's that play at the end of, gosh, what game was it when he just chucked it down the court? The loss to Florida State, maybe? One of the ACC uh, losses. Was, yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, it was Florida State. Yeah. Florida mm-hmm. State, I think. And that's where it's like, yeah, I, I know you've made that pass before, but make it when you're a hundred percent sure it's going to work or 95% yeah. sure. And that's tough to tell a point guard because in order to make it work, you have to see the hole in playoff instincts and just do it. And I don't know. He was great in this game. Really the entire team stepped up. It was their best performance mm-hmm. of the season. And it wasn't even, everyone was saying it was a complete game. I agree, but also it was really just a complete 20 minutes. Like they totally took over the game. Yeah. by winning the second half by 25 points. I didn't even right. know they were really capable of that, but it shows you, remember Jeff Goodman, we had him on, and he told us, I thought there was going to be more highs with this team. We haven't seen them to this point. They were due for a positive shooting regression. This was the highs that we were sort of expecting when we were talking about the team in the preseason. Yeah, absolutely. And one of those guys Jeff Goodman brought up was Cole Swider. And we'll talk a little bit about him. I know you've got some thoughts that you want to get to with Cole, also the defense, and... We must tip our hat to the crowd. They yes. shut me up. They're making me look like an idiot right now. We'll do that in just a second. But first, it's the New Year, so that means New Year's resolutions. If yours is about getting fit or eating healthier, make sure that Built Bar is a part of that plan. Whether it's uh, you want something co- hun- covered in 100% chocolate or just something that's genuinely healthy for you, Built Bar is what you need. 130 calories, 4 grams of sugar, 4 net carbs, and 17 grams of protein. Compare that to a candy bar, which usually has 240 calories, 30 grams of sugar, and dozen of net carbs. That's no good for you. Built Bars, though, on the other hand, super healthy for you. Here's an idea for the new year. Go to all your secret treat stashes at home, in the pantry, wherever you keep them. Throw out all the sugary, calorie-filled treats and replace them with Built Bars. And they've got so many different flavors to choose from, whether it's our favorite on the show, the peanut butter brownie, coconut almond, raspberry cookies and cream, salted caramel, mint brownie, and so many more. Built Bar is always coming out with new limited-time flavors. So Check out Built.com often to see what's new. Go to Built.com and use our promo code LOCKED15 and get 15% off your order. Again, that's promo code LOCKED15 for 15% off at Built.com. All right, let's look at the game that Cole Swider had. One of his best, maybe his best overall as a member of the Orange. Finishes with 18 points. I mean, in most other games, we're talking about him as a guy who maybe led the team in scoring with 18 points. 8 of 11, hyper-efficient, knocks down both of his threes. And this is exactly what Jeff Goodman was talking about on the show. Like, I thought, his quote, I thought Cole Swider would be better. This is what he's talking about. Maybe you're not getting this every single night. Actually, you're not getting this every single night because you're not (laughs) eight for 11 and 100 percent from three. Um, But could he be a guy who's shooting about 50 percent from the field, 40 percent from three and giving you 13, 14 points a game? That's, I think, the Cole Swider that people envisioned coming to Syracuse. And you, you got a taste of it in this game. Yeah, and it's easy to pick an X-factor on this team because it feels like you could rotate that each game. You know, Joe Girard feels like an easy selection for that award. Jesse, at times, feels like it. You could even argue, oh, if Benny reaches some potential in the second half of the season, that changes the ceiling of this team. Saimir, like, everyone qualifies sometimes as an X-factor. It's kind of a silly Mm -hmm. thing. But I do think when Cole plays well and when he plays like this, then we sort of see the team that we if you were optimistic about the team we're envisioning in the preseason and thinking back to how we viewed him in the preseason, we were having legit conversations about who is the second leading scorer on this team. And I think both you and I picked Cole Swider based on how he played in some of the exhibition games. And it just hasn't panned out. He was a dead eye shooter at Villanova that is really just not making shots and not handling this up in a sort of responsibility very well at Syracuse. But he, he just played more free in this game. It felt like when he did get to his spots, which he really has been getting to his spots fine, it's sometimes not the prettiest thing ever, but he can get to that turnaround on the baseline. Like he has some moves that we've sort of picked up on now the more you watch him. 
this time he was just making them and he was just shooting him, shooting them with a little bit more confidence and a little bit more freedom. There wasn't any hesitation when he got to his spot. He just did it. And that's what we need from him. He's huge. Yeah. I don't know if it's just getting back home. I don't know. Like, cause it's inconsistent with him. It's not like this is the first time he's had a good shooting night this season. He's had a couple of them this year, but I, not again, enough though. This exactly. Is, yeah. Exactly. It's not enough. And that's the reason why this team finds itself where it is. Like, even though they went out and had a huge win against a team that probably will be in the NCAA tournament, like you need this night in and night out if you want to exploit a down ACC that's looking to try to get four or five bids into the tournament. Like Syracuse should be in the conversation for that right now, and they are are pretty far off on it right now. Um, all right, let's get into the burning issue, especially in regards yeah. to us. Because I tweeted out from our account a couple. This was after the pit loss. Uh, I hope less than 10,000 show up at the Dome on Saturday after this game and every game after. The only way to spark change is to embarrass. And I said that, and it caught a lot of flack. It also caught some support, too. But it, it, the flack was more noteworthy. Some former <laughs> players getting involved in the weeds as well. Um, and I listen, I don't know if I fired up people enough where they wanted to, to go to the game, but they showed out. And... and specifically credit has to be given to the student section, Absolutely. not just for this game, the whole damn year, not just basketball, football too. Like they have shown up every single game that they have been on campus for. And they deserve a ton of credit for that. The entire Otto's army, uh, Jonathan Danlick is, is one of the guys who, who follows us on Twitter and, and interacts with us during some of the games and stuff. They've done a fantastic job this year at getting all of these fans out from the student section. The locals ha have started to pull their weight, too, uh, in some of these games, especially in a game like this. In football season, they weren't there. But for a basketball game, I mean, the 23,000 that showed up, it's the largest on-campus crowd for a game this season. They shut me up. And, and yeah. a lot of credit goes their way for, for what they did, showing up, not letting a, a down game and maybe some of the, the frustrations of the pit loss impact the attendance and i believe uh steve forbes said after the game something along the lines yeah. of the crowd made a difference he said it was one of the better student sections he's seen and that was his first time at the carrier dome too. keep that in mind they didn't play at the dome last year i don't even think we played way last year actually well there were no COVID. fans too so we, yeah right yeah. <laughs> that's a good point forgot about that and i do think i mean the student section you cannot say enough about them they have really turned the corner when we were there that would have been like a Duke game to get a crowd like that. Like I kept looking up at the yeah. student section thinking, holy cow. I mean, the student section itself it filled to the top would have been about what, what as was many the shirt they fans. Had? The blizzard. Was that what they yeah, the, the blizzard yeah, white the blizzard. shirts, which yeah. look cool. Great mm -hmm. idea. Probably helped a little bit to get more students in there. I mean, it was zero degrees. I read in Syracuse yesterday and the student section has no reason really to be there based on performance, but they showed out and credit to those fans because that helps. And it just felt good to watch a somewhat full dome. It felt good to know that Giannis was kind of getting the dome experience. I was a little yep. worried about that at times, but the student section has really come a long way from when we were there. And that's credit to the leadership there and everything, because that makes a difference. I always was kind of bummed that we didn't have more of a stronger student section unless yeah. it was student section was not very good when i was there yeah in school and, and we overlapped for three years so. right yeah it was honestly just in the student section i don't know what the number would have been but wake forest is probably getting their entire crowd just what the student section was at most of their home games so that yeah. makes a huge difference we need that and i don't know i mean i know a lot of people came at you for that tweet and by the way i feel bad for you because I feel like you're getting lumped into this <laughs> comment. And I'm not one that's saying that we need to start signing our tweets so we know who's saying what because right. I think that's also stupid. But uh, I feel bad you for you. I'd like, the games, I would like to apologize cares. to you, Tim, for lumping <laughs> you into this and, and you wow. getting the negative blowback here. The only reason that I'm – I mean, I'm not – I see what you're saying by – you know, in order to impact change, you hit them where the wallet is. That makes all sense. And by the way, Louisville pretty much did that. And Chris Mack is gone. Yeah. The things that I guess I would push back on for Syracuse specifically is there's never going to be a world where Jim Beheim is fired, right? Like right. what change are we really getting to? Jim Beheim's going to walk out point. on his own terms. So 
it's not really worth it for me. If it was some guy that I truly passionately wanted fired, and I know we've talked about how we kind of think this Jim Beheim thing needs to end here, and we're not the only people to say that, so I still sort of stand by that, but I'm not to the point where it's like I can't go to a game and I can't support that guy. He's done a lot of good things for the program. So, And then the other thing is I can get behind that take more when it's an NFL or an NBA team and the players are getting paid when it's kids and and they're not getting paid and they're trying hard. It's a little tougher, but I see what you're saying. I mean, if it was not Syracuse, like at Louisville, Mm -hmm. they did that and it worked. And you can't tell me that that wasn't part of the reason why Chris Mack was fired. Yeah. And I say it from a standpoint of, okay, I'm in Chicago. All right. This has happened now with the bulls and the bears. It was embarrassing. The United Center is the biggest NBA venue that there is, and they're pulling nobody. And the Reinsdorf said, this is embarrassing. We're getting the coach out. We're getting the GM out. We're flushing in new people. And what do you know? The Bulls are one of the best teams in the NBA this year. It's a quick turnaround right there. You look at the Bears this past season. A lot of people didn't think Ryan Pace was going to be fired at the end of the year. Some people didn't think Matt Nagy would even be fired at the end of the year unless things really went haywire. People stopped showing up, and you got the mm-hmm. change that you wanted. And that's that's where I was coming from. Maybe it's just a big market tactic. I don't know. Um, but it's something that I've seen work in the past, and that's why I brought it up. Again, you bring up a valid counterpoint to it, though. This is a different situation here because like, would if this were to happen with the San Antonio Spurs, per se, Right. Would, would it would you see pop pushed out now? Would they say, all right, pop, maybe it's time to step down. Maybe. And maybe that's the conversation that would have been had if, if things started to get bad from an attendance standpoint. But uh, my, my favorite response to all of this uh, <laughs> was this one lady was tweeting at us like nonstop. Like, I think we were getting like one an hour from her over the past two days. Um, and she goes. Blank you, us diehards watched a really good game right now, aren't we? Way to go, and you all can just go away. I think she tried to kick us out of the city um, as well. She tried to send <laughs> us to a new city. So uh, thank you for thank you for that. We appreciate uh, we appreciate the kind words there. Yeah, that's funny. I I know it riled up some of the fan base, but credit to the uh, entire fan base for showing yeah. up, and also mainly the student section. I think they deserve tons of credit and. Look, I mean, I'm not saying they're going to make the tournament or something here, but I don't want it to be a losing season, and every little bit helps, and you're going through a stretch where we'll talk about it, I'm sure, later on in the week, but NC State's coming up. That's a road game, Mm -hmm. but it's NC State on the road. You might be favored in that game. It's kind of a big one to see, okay, was Wake Forest a fluke or not, but also there's some winnable games here that they could go on at least a little bit of a run to make it a more respectable season. Does that mean they're going to make the NCAA tournament? Maybe not, but I think you and I both agree they're better than a 10 and 11 team. And Mm -hmm. I'd like to see them finish with a record that is more representative of what this caliber of team really is. Yeah. I wholeheartedly agree with with that. And again, that's the frustrating part is they're a better than 10 and 11 team and and they're not showing it. And, And there's a couple of games here where, it's just there are inexcusable losses on this schedule right now. So we'll see what happens moving forward. Tomorrow on the show, we will have James Zuba on, one of the locals who I didn't piss off. He actually still <laughs> likes me. I was texting with as him As far earlier. as you know. As yeah. far as I know. Maybe we will have him address it on the show tomorrow. Um, but yeah. Um, also, also one, one last thing on the crowd. I don't think it was Giannis infused. And what I no. mean by that is I don't think 23,000 came out to see Giannis. I think 20... Maybe like 2,000 showed up for Giannis. 21,000 showed up to see that that team. Even yeah. as bad as they are this year, 21,000 showed up to see that team. 2,000 may have showed up for Giannis, if that. I did hear that there were some jerseys, like Giannis jerseys in the crowd, which I was even surprised that there were any because Milwaukee to Syracuse isn't quite the connection there. But I don't know. It is cool that Giannis What's the was Greek there. population in, in Syracuse? I don't have that offhand. There's, I know our guy Gil it, Gross, the guy who vo- voices the Debundos digits, he says that Greek food is the the black hole of the Syracuse uh, cuisine scene. Okay, like Syracuse covers it all. Whatever you want, Italian's right. great. Uh, everything's good, but the <laughs> one little black hole is, is Greek food. Yeah, 
I know there's a couple Greek players on the volleyball team, at least when I was there. I remember that. Yeah. I, I don't mm-hmm. really know what the Greek population is. It feels like it's it can't be that much in Syracuse, but I'm sure if anyone was there, they were holding up the flag at the Dome. And maybe some people can tweet us whether they saw some flags because I feel like Giannis is just such a cult hero there. Yeah, no, absolutely. All right, so we will have James Zuba on tomorrow to talk about everything that we've seen from the past couple of days with this Syracuse team. Uh, this whole season will break down and what lies ahead for the Orange. For Tim, I'm Tyler. We'll talk to you guys tomorrow.